Good morning and welcome everybody to Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church. My name is Pastor Kerry, and I welcome you today. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship this morning as we pour the water in the baptismal font. The grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. How about we sing verse 1 and 5? And our opening hymn is All Our Welcome and it's found in your bulletin. As you can see, I'm not your regular pastor here today. My voice is somewhat lower, my hair is somewhat lighter, and I'm about an inch or two shorter than Pastor Megan. But I'm glad to be here with you today as Pastor Megan is walking to fight breast cancer this morning. Yay! And now let us commit with our, let us continue with our service with our readings. Son of 
those who did that were driving a new cart with the Ark of God, and the wheel went in front of the Ark. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obadiah to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed the ox and the cattle. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girded with the linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. They brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place, inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and offerings of well-being before the Lord. When David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the offerings of well-being, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed food among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, to each a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. And then all the people went back to their homes. Word of hope, word of life. Thanks be to God. The earth is God most highs, and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. For God, God has founded it on the seas, and has established it on the rivers. Who ascended the hill of God most high, and who shall stand in God's holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false, and who do not swear to deceit. They will receive blessing from the God Most High and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek Him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the highest ruler of glory may be coming. Who is the King of glory, the God Most High, strong and mighty, our God? Mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the highest ruler of glory come in heaven. Who is the highest ruler of glory? The God of hosts is the ruler of glory. The second reading is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Blessed be the Father and Mother, or the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He designed us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance having been destined according to the purposes of him who accomplishes all things, according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance for redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. Word of hope, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be God, God. God.
King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing he was a righteous and holy man. And he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers, and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved. Yet, out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Greetings to you, my sisters and brothers, saints and sinners, children of God. Now in our reading today from Mark, we find something different and unusual. And it's rather surprisingly hard ending to it that does not seem to bring us the typical good news we've been finding all season. In the first place, Jesus is explicitly missing from the narrative. Oh sure, he's casually mentioned by virtue of a rumor in Herod's ears at the beginning, but he's not really present in this text. Now, secondly, the main bulk of this narrative is not actually in the present time in Mark. In fact, here we have this rather paranoid king, and with good reason, ruminating on this person he's been hearing about named Jesus, who some say is a prophet, some say is Elijah, and some say, and Herod agrees with this, that he's John the Baptist come back from the dead, from his beheading whether he's resurrected or reincarnated or whatever King Herod's belief systems happen to be at that moment in time. And why not? Because being a king, Herod thinks it's all about him. And naturally, Jesus has got to be this John the Baptist come back from the dead out to seek revenge on him for having been unfairly executed. And then we move into a flashback something that's taken completely out of time. And it's not anything that Herod actually wanted to do. In fact, 
Herod was having a good time having John the Baptist in his prison. And while this strange man frightened Herod, the king, who seems to be someone who's interested in the mysterious, in the, the freakish, in the odd, he really enjoyed listening to John the Baptist. But his wife, and we're not sure exactly how she became separated from her previous husband, whether it was by divorce or whether she was widowed from him. And his brother was also named Herod, by the way. They just weren't very creative with their names in those days. She was, she's tired of the accusations leveled against her by John because she remarried Herod. She had quite a different take on the situation having this man in her prison, in their prison, and was not really happy to have him around. And so, in a classic biblical style that seems as much borrowed from older legends as it is original to the gospel, the king makes a promise to his beloved stepdaughter and cannot take it back when she asks for the unthinkable, the head of this man, John the Baptist, on a platter. Now, it's gory, for certain. It's not something you expect from a teenage girl, even one who's been raised in royal households with an immature mind and a tendency to objectify those that are beneath her. So why does she take the advice of her mother and ask for such a petty ending to this prophet in her jails? Authors over the last couple centuries have had have tried to recreate motives for her with one way, one rationale or another as to why she did this. One particularly famous one was judged by Oscar Wilde. Some of you might be familiar with his play Salome. It's been adopted in several ways by uh, opera or uh, uh, there was a movie a few years back, Salome's Last Dance. It was actually rather enjoyable. But ultimately, the tale pans out to the oath that Herod Antipas made to her. Anything her, heart's her heart desires. And out of regard to his oath and to save face in front of his guests at this wonderful banquet, Herod complies. And in the end, he winds up performing this rather heinous deed against this man, John the Baptist, who is already under his power after who has already been imprisoned in his household, and for no better reason than to please his guests and to fulfill an oath that he made carelessly to the daughter of his wife. Now, how easy might it have been to, for him to have done the right thing and refuse her? How easy should it have been for Herod to say, don't be ridiculous, Salome. This is not something that you actually want me to do. I have just offered you half of my kingdom. And you want such a terrible thing. Now, I'm just afraid the consequences of this thing that you ask are too severe. You must choose something that is actually in my power to give. Something that you actually want. Not something that your mother told you that you wanted. <laughs> How his arrogance gives him the belief that he has this power over life and death. How humiliate, humility could have made all the difference in the world. And this could have had such a less tragic ending. Now, you might have read in your bulletins that I am a pastor awaiting call. Well, there's some good news this morning um, that it will be announced actually uh, in a short while, once they start having their worship service, which is in five minutes, that I will be announced at, to the, by the call committee of Lutheran Church of the Cross in Berkeley that I'm going to be voted on as their pastor by their congregation in two weeks. Oh, now, one of the things that makes me an especially suitable pastor to, for this church, which does a lot of work with marginal per populations, particularly homeless youth and people with prison records, is my affinity for those populations. Now, while I've been awaiting call, and it started while I was in seminary, but I've been continuing doing it. I've been engaged with volunteer ministry in San Quentin Prison several times a week, and I work on the outside with convicted felons as well, who have come out from long-term incarceration in California prisons. 
And it makes me wonder about how we can live here in California, this most liberal of states. And if you look on any map, it, California is the bluest of the blue, only to be outdone by Massachusetts, maybe. <laughs> and I use the term liberal, liberally. How can we live in this state which has such regressive penal institutions? How can we have the lowest crime rate that we've had in decades and still have a growing prison population? Why is it that when people go in front of a judge that they receive time and time and more time in these places? A typical prison sentence for some of these men and women is 10 years to life. 10 years to life. And they go in front of the, their, their, their boards after 10 years is when this starts, this whole process starts, and they get denied. And they go in front of them another five years, and they get denied. And it, the 10 years winds up being life for not always good or arbitrary reasons. Only a few weeks ago, I was speaking with one of those prisoners at San Quentin who had received a good board hearing, in fact. Actually, the board recommended that this prisoner be released. Because he had done a lot of good work. He'd gone through nonviolence training. He'd gotten a degree while he was in prison. He's done things like restorative justice programs. He was literally a model prisoner who, despite his vicious crime of three decades ago, was today someone more who more than anyone needed to be out on the street today. And the board agreed with that assessment, and they made the recommendation for his release. But on the day I was talking to this fellow, just, he was distressed, he was unhappy, because de despite the board recommendation, it only takes one person to say no. The governor of California decided to deny his recommendation. And this model prisoner has to wait another three years before he gets to see the board again. And so why is it when it's clear that our prisons are overcrowded, when it's evident that men and women need to be released, when the federal government has declared that our prison population is unconstitutional, that our governor refuses to alleviate the situation? Now, maybe it's because our governor is not actually listening to his constituents, constituents or common sense. Instead, of, instead, in this one instance, and I, I agree that Jerry Brown has done a lot of good things for this state, but he seems to be rather myopic in a few certain areas. And he seems to be listening to certain people that he wants to please in those areas. Now, it might actually be that he really does want to do the right thing, and I give him the benefit of the doubt for that but he might not actually know what the right thing is. And one would think that a man who first rose to power in California in the liberal and freewheeling 1970s would want to appeal to the demographic that is his actual and natural base. One would think that he would follow the dictates of common sense and follow through with the federal judge's order and do the right thing by the people. He has to be aware that the system, as it is, is not working, nor has it been for many years. But there are other players in play. There is another wild beast that we call the prison industrial complex, who, like Herodias, wants a different outcome altogether. But in the face of that man he denied, the face of that man who was sentenced 25 to life, who 35 years after the murder that he committed in an act of drugs, jealousy, and rage, who has been clean and sober for the last 25 years, and has finished a graduate degree, may wind up next spring in hospice. And he might die in prison. As the prison population in California steadily becomes more elderly, because while we've been more lax about drug crimes in recent years, We've decided that violent offenders, and no matter what their individual circumstances was, are still less likely to be sent to the streets. Despite the fact that murderers, in particular murderers, are way less likely to recidivism, which means that they're way less likely to commit either that crime or any crime once they get back out. 
Because governors hear more from prison corporations, more from prison guard unions, more from what we call victims' rights organizations, which sounds really nice, victims' rights. Victims should have rights, right? Right. But they thrive on cherry-picking cases to get their word across. The kind of cases that lend their names to things like Susie's Law, or Miriam's Law, or whatever the law is that is popular in that day and age because of something we've heard about on the news that Nancy Grace was putting forward. Organizations that operate under the fallacy that in order for victims to find satisfaction that offenders have to be continuously locked away, that justice lies in punishment punishment and more punishment. That despite the fact that we claim that state prisons are correctional institutions, they continue to act as arbitrary enforcers of punishment and arbitrarily black and brown people rather than white. But for the people that they store, that they warehouse, be they white, black, or brown, or any other color or mix of color, which almost really matters very little, because the system has become a stockpile of flesh. Are they taking up space out of society when they can best, best, most of them, best be a part of making society better? But these men and women in prison are like you and me, way more like us than different from us. Now while in our comfort, in our desire to make them separate from us, Genteel society likes to call them criminals, as if by virtue of engaging in a criminal act magically transforms a person into something that's less than human, something that's different from us. But these men and women are people, and they are the face of Jesus Christ, sometimes scarred, sometimes tattooed in faces, but Jesus Christ nevertheless. And this bloated system, of which very few of us can any longer say that we are not affected by the way of some way or another. Because I know many of you have nieces and nephews or children or grandchildren that have been in the system. Or you know someone or love someone that has gotten into the system and haven't been able to get out of the system. Despite its evil nature, it is full of human beings who deserve something considerably more humane. And it is in that way that we, like John the Baptist, can lift our voices and be heard. We can name the evil in society. We can call it out. We can speak to power. That the governor has an obligation to serve the people that he serves. All the people that he serves and not the forces of those like Herodias that benefit from the current system, or those like Salome who get told what's best and don't actually know what it is. Because our governor is very much alive and here and now, and can still be aware that his decisions impact real lives and real people, not just prisoners, but all of those affected by the fact that they get removed from society. We can learn about who these men and women are, and we can lift up their stories, and we can write to the governor, and we can advocate on behalf of them. And we can make the change we want to see in the world. Because although Jesus seems to be silent in today's reading, he's actually quite present in the way that this reading makes us feel about poor John the Baptist and those that are stuck under the thumb of those in power. It is in that love for us, that grace that he has gifted to us, that Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection has made us, we are loving and human and caring and capable of feeling as much for the guilty sinner as we are for those around us. We who are forgiven are capable of forgiving and giving mercy to other people. We, whose God has granted pardon us, are the worthy advocates on behalf of those that the state would ignore. We live out his promise for us by sharing that promise with others, by writing to our governors and our representatives, by writing to the prisoners and telling them that they are loved and we are thinking of them, 
by donating our time and energy to prisoner rights groups and by visiting those who are confined. And also by helping those that come out. Because when you've had a prison sentence, that's like this big red mark of trying to find a job or finding housing. And we listen to them. And we know by the compassion that we and love that we feel for them that in being lost and forgiven, we have been gifted that love and grace from the one who gives it, our God. In the victory over death, he has given us victory over the shackles of the grave and released us from our prisons. And know, my sisters and brothers, that the good news, even in this gospel reading, is alive and well. That in Christ's mercy we are given good new life, and in Christ's grace we share that life with others. The oppressors and the oppressed. And that, my sisters and brothers, is so very good news. Amen. 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 Megan and all the staff and leaders of our congregation and our
our present pastor as well. Help us to care for our climate, conserve water, and draw closer to God in all that we do at work and at home. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Loving God, give us listening ears and healthy bodies. Provide special care and support to those who are eradicating cancer from their body and provide a special blessing for the spouses, healthcare providers, lab techs, and researchers who support those whose mind, bodies, or spirits are in need of care. We yearn for justice and await the day we will be reunited with those we have lost. But there is no rush, so help us to live the best we can with the time we have. God in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For whom and what else do the people of grace pray? Today, Lord, I pray along with fully all the people here at Grace for someone very dear to me who is troubled by health problems at this time. My grandnephew, Nicholas, is awaiting a heart transplant at Lurie Children's Hospital. His uh, father, Daniel, my my nephew and his wife, Kathy, are all waiting and praying. But Nicholas does not have a lot of time left, Lord, and you, of course, know that. Be with him, be with his family, give them the support they need, and also for all those other children, three others waiting for hearts, Jamie and Ireland and Matthias and the children who have cancer, so many of them on the floors of Lori's Children's Hospital in Chicago. Be with them, Lord, and give them some peace and strength. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, please be with Megan and Pam as they finish their 39-mile walk for something so important to all of us, breast cancer research. Help them have the strength to get through this day and to be proud of what they've done. Lord, in your mercy. Our prayers rise like incense, are in our health by a loving God who yearns for us to be our best. May we sleep well, worry less, and live convinced that God is on our side. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And I'll be with you. At this time, let us share a sign of peace with one another.
Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Now let us all pray as Christ taught.
rise with a blessing. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. And now is the time for announcements. I don't have any announcements myself, but is there anybody in the congregation that has announcements? On behalf of Grace Lutheran Church, we thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Okay, and now it's time for our sending him, Great is thy faithfulness. 